deciduous trees, fall work, big topic for this evening. And one of the things that I wanted to come back to in the live stream was coming back to some of those fundamental building blocks that we kind of had in, in 2017 and 2018. We've focused so much on a lot of tertiary information over 2019 as a way to build those broad topics, those secondary topics, and now some of these tertiary topics. But coming back to deciduous trees, this is one of those genres of bonsai activity that is under-discussed, I think misunderstood to a large degree. And so on a tree uh, such as this Cydonia tonight, this is a Cydonia oblaga. Oblaga? Uh, oblonga. Oblonga. Okay, which is, if you want to know the truth, the only true quince that exists in the world. This is the one, not a pseudocydonia, a Chinese quince, which is pseudo, just like pseudo tsuga as the Doug fir, not a true suga, right? Or we talk about the Japanese quince, Canameles. We talk about the chojubai, Canameles japonica chojubai as the variety. This is the only true quince, Cydonia oblonga, and uh, a, a piece of material that Randy Field grew. He still has a lot of these, actually. Hint, hint, if you guys are interested in this species. And really digging into how do we take advantage of this fall season. But before we begin, I want to kind of set the tone. Baseline deciduous knowledge, timing of work, division of our deciduous species, and how we take advantage or work with some of those nuances. We prepared a little clip for you guys. Take a look at this. This is gonna set our foundation. I hope it answers a lot of questions, but it will at least start the discussion so that we're all on the same page. We're gonna blast you out. Have a look at this. When we come back, we'll answer questions and dig in to the initial structural setting, taking advantage of the fall season on this very cool little quince. All right, we'll see you guys in a minute. As we solidify our deciduous knowledge and start to really form our framework around timing for the deciduous process, I wanted to step to the whiteboard for a moment and just kind of outline where are our opportunities in the creation of deciduous material to really have that moment to wire, to prune, and to be able to handle our deciduous material in all of those different seasons of the year. Now, when we think about deciduous trees, we've got to be able to delineate that difference of what would motivate us to pursue work at different periods of time based on how the tree is going to respond. And this strategy for all of these applications of technique is gonna be dependent also upon what phase of development is that deciduous tree in. However, when we focus on wiring and we focus on pruning as a general practice, we can make some milestones over the course of the year that allow us to tap into different growth habits of deciduous species to maximize their evolution as bonsai. Let's go ahead and just start in the initial phase of the year in that spring season where we start to see the buds swell preparing for the big push of foliar growth. Now we know over the course of that spring season, depending on the stage of development of the deciduous tree, we're gonna be performing different actions based on our different deciduous material. Let's divide our deciduous trees into high water mobility and low water mobility just based on that concept that some of our deciduous trees are moving so much water that at the wrong times of the year, if we apply the wrong application of technique, we can cause that tree to excessively bleed. And we would always say our Japanese maples are kind of that reference for high water mobility, but we also see species such as beech, as well as some of our other high water moving species that can bleed if it is a tree that has a lot of water in its system. The indication for this, of course, would be a prune in that spring season prior to the flush of growth and the, ex and the expression of moisture coming out of that cut site causing a dampening color on the bark of the tree. If we see this in an action we perform, we're going to pull back. Now our hornbeams, our tamarisks, some of our other deciduous varieties, trident maples, are going to be in that lower water mobility, which means that we can perform that pruning action as the buds swell prior to the push of growth. But this time in early spring is also a major opportunity for our low water mobility trees to be performing the wiring operation, to be performing that pruning operation. And we look at this as a pivotal time in terms of number one time in the year for low water mobility. Pruning as well as wiring to dictate that shape when the tree is void of its leaf system. Now over the course of spring, we may be pinching, we may be allowing to elongate, harden, and prune. 
We're not really sure, and it depends, again, upon the species and upon what we're trying to accomplish. But we do reach this next milestone marker where we see that first flush harden as a big time of year to be able to come back in and correctively prune, make big trunk chops, or alter the state of the branching system in our high water mobility trees to avoid that point where they're going to be bleeding and losing energy as a result of that water mobility that they had prior to the bud push. We call this that high water mobility. Timing for pruning in particular as a very specific and special aspect of our high water mobility deciduous trees. Can we be wiring at this time as well? Sure, we could. The problem is when we have high water mobility trees or in any of our deciduous trees that have pushed out a canopy, we do come back in and prune. We also may be looking for that partial defoliation whether it be a small leaf variety where we're simply gonna be pruning back to reduce the leaf quantity, or in our larger leaf varieties where we're gonna be decreasing the leaf size of the leaves that remain after the pruning process by two thirds, leaving that 30% of leaf mass to stimulate not only another flush of growth, but hopefully more ramification in order to improve the quality of that tree's secondary and tertiary refinement stages. From this point moving forward, we have the ability to partially defoliate multiple times on trees that are expressing a very strong uh, habit or behavior to grow. And we can sort of stagger those as each flush hardens, utilizing that partial defoliation or in our smaller leaf varieties, the ability to again, correctively or refinement prune to build that continued shape and expansion of our ramification. When we get into this fall season, fall is another major time because we make this transition from our foyer growth to our vascular growth. This is when a deciduous tree puts on a lot of the meat on the branches, which for our larger leaf varieties can cause some coarseness. For our finer leaf varieties, it just builds that system to make it winter tolerant and also sets the stage for next year and the flush of growth we can expect in the spring. Now in this fall season, we also experience a major opportunity on almost all of our deciduous varieties to potentially in a developmental stage, again, come back in and wire that structure take advantage of that thickening process with the full leaf mass intact, and in doing so, maximize the development that we can get on our primary structure. We call this a great time on all deciduous to be able to wire, particularly for structure, knowing that we're gonna have to be dealing with that leaf mass and we don't wanna reduce that leaf mass heavily because we want the thickening and the accumulation of sugars and starches over the fall season to set structure, build winter hardiness, as well as be able to expand what the tree is gonna produce next season. And in the developmental stage for all of our deciduous trees, the accumulation of energy is what builds the meat in that structural branching and builds the ability to expand on that tree's growth next season when it flushes out in the spring. Over the course of the fall season, we do hit one more pivotal time at that transitional point where the color starts to change, the chlorophyll and the green coloration and the elements that create that chlorophyll are absorbed into the vacuoles of the cells in the finer branches, the primary branches, the trunk, and expand into the root system to be able to increase that winter hardiness and preserve those elements that give us that chlorophyll and that photosynthetic capacity with that green color. At that time where those pigments are reabsorbed, we have another major opportunity in all deciduous to come back in and prune, to be able to sidestep that bleeding potential for our high water mobility in the spring, but also to be able to take advantage of that movement of all of those resources and their distribution across the cells as it reabsorbs those elements, to be able to correctively prune, make decisions, and get away with one last alteration of the shape to prepare for the winter silhouette and set the tree up for next spring's bud push by that proactive fall pruning. So we see over the course of the year, we have a major opportunity to wire here in the spring prior to bud push on some of our species. We have a major opportunity to wire at the beginning of the fall, although we're gonna be competing with the leaf mass that exists. And we see we can provide partial defoliation, different methodologies of pinching and pruning, and we can come back and take advantage of that late fall color change and the shedding of the leaves as another opportunity to prune to prepare our deciduous trees and advance their aesthetic. Just this simple backbone of understanding that our timing and our technique across the season 
has multiple opportunities to be implemented, and we're really looking at, is our deciduous a high water mobility that can bleed potentially? Is it a low water mobility that opens up a lot more opportunity in terms of timing? And when are we gonna perform the action to take advantage, knowing the limitations of the foliar mass making wiring difficult to maximize that tree's evolution? Tonight, we're gonna be working on a quince, a cydonia. That's a very special, small piece of nursery stock very available, readily opportune uh, species for you guys to work with and something that you can find. And we're gonna take advantage of the fact that the leaf mass is large and still on the tree to set that structure, allow that leaf mass to cause that structure to thicken over the fall and begin the process of shaping this as a bonsai in this level of consideration over the course of the year. Knowing now the timing combined with all of the information that exists on Mirai Live, you have the tools to make the decisions that are appropriate for your deciduous material to maximize their growth over the course of the year, continue their evolution from development to secondary to refinement, and choose those moments where you can get in and really have a dramatic impact on your tree. Okay, so I hope that set the tone for some of the mystery around deciduous trees. And it, again, I wanna say, you know, taking this back to a very fundamental, almost, almost a referential nursery stock piece of material, I would say, in terms of how we're going to handle it. I would say that um, in terms of this, that is a very broad overview of the actual deciduous model and the timings, but it helps us orient and it helps us understand when we can get away with some of the scopes of work and why we can get away with some of those scopes of work. So as always to begin, I'm going to go ahead and give you guys one singular rotation. I'll walk you through what's happened to this tree once it was removed from the healing in bed that Randy typically uses in the transition from the field to a containerized environment. And I found this to be so charming. Just it had this really beautiful, interesting base. Obviously, Cydonia and Quince in general typically tend to have a very large leaf, so it is tough to see. But there's some interest here. There's a, a very large piece of nabari. There's a little, little gap in the base here that we've covered up by the, the front that we've chosen to cut down on that negative space, which decreases that visual stability. So you guys can see if I, you can see that space. And then from the front where we're at, you can see how we close down that space. But when we start to look at this, recognizing that we're just in these massive leaves, we're just entering the point in the season where we're past the real intense heat of summer. We start to see a lot of the buds swell on our trees. We see back budding forming on a lot of our conifers and for our deciduous, we know this is the moment where the beginning of all of that meat and all of that content of vascular tissue is gonna accumulate on the structure. And even though we have these leaves when we're dealing with rougher deciduous trees, where we're putting that structure in place for that first time, we want to take advantage of the fact that as we allowed this tree to push out after the repot, we have all of this flexible branching. And from this point through the end of fall, this flexible branching is going to lose malleability to a greater and greater degree as it accumulates all of that energy on the leaf mass that we're going to leave on this opportune time to set that structure while it's still thin, it's recovered from the operation, and we're gonna add a lot of meat that's gonna make movement, mobility, and the addition of, of any curvature into those branches much more difficult after this fall. So this is that moment where we can take advantage of where the tree's at, the strength that's accumulated, and the fact that it's only gonna get thicker and harder to bend after this point. Now I'm sure there are some questions, so let me just walk you through the timing. Randy dug this from the field in 2017 and healed it into a, uh, the sawdust on top of the weed cloth, which he talked about in the how to uh, perform correct aftercare on collected trees. He uses that for his field grown trees in the Pacific Northwest because it's cold and it's wet. So we saw that action in 2018, the tree grew a lot in that, in that healed in scenario. We took it out of that in the fall of 2018, we healed it in up here at Mirai. And this spring in 2019, we cut the root system back very heavily. We also cut back the foliar mass very heavily. And you can see here, there are big cuts that we didn't even take the time to heal uh, or necessarily paste or handle correctly. We just cut them back to the collar. Quince, a very vigorous species. Would I have healed it in retrospect? Absolutely. Why didn't I do it? Because we were repotting so many trees at that time. I never came back to it. Always heal your big cuts. You can see where the callus is starting to roll right around that big cut site. You can see the cut site having dried out a little bit. I may choose to rewound that and paste that uh, after we're done with the work tonight. But then we allowed the tree to grow. And the quince is a little bit of a slow butter. 
So when we talk about that response to that big cut, whether it's a Chinese quince, whether it's a true quince, a cydonia, um, we don't see them push out with that same rapidity in the spring as we see other species. When they're having that massive root work done and that pivotal first big heavy prune on that root system, if you wanted to reference that deciduous root pruning for a tree coming out of the field or having spent a bit of time in a healed in scenario, you would want to watch the pomegranate repotting stream where we prune the structure and we prune the big roots and then allow that tree to recover over the course of the season. But again, the tree responded extremely well. It generated all of this growth. These are fresh shoots as of this year. All of this growth on any one of these shoots, this tree was cut to the trunk. Big structural work was done all the way down to stub off. We had no fine branches on the tree. This is all one season of growth and that shows you that's just our vegetative growth over the spring season that you're seeing on this tree. A, a real demonstration of their strength, of their stored resources that occur over the fall season. And this big leaf mass is going to add probably double the size of the vascular tissue on this tree in the next three months. I need to get wire on it now. And there are a lot of deciduous species that have this opportunity at this time, just prior to or at the beginning of vascular growth, to set that structure on the growth that occurred that year and take advantage of that fall vascular production to set that structure and really set that, that initial shaping into those branches as it adds wood to prepare for next spring, the winter hardiness and next spring's bud push, okay? Let's just talk about the aesthetics. We'll come back to your questions. And one thing I wanna draw your attention to, Jesus, can you kind of focus in right here behind that leaf and just where the, where the pieces popped below that cut? Let me know when you're there. Okay, so you can see I arbitrarily kept a lot of the transitions of taper that occurred in this trunk to hold that movement in. A lot of times when we cut a deciduous tree back, you see people cut every single thick piece back to the trunk, and that would mean that any of our primary structure would be regrown and would be this thin coming off the trunk. We would have just this stump at the top of our tree. I'm not a big fan of that approach to deciduous because these pieces create that transition of taper from the trunk to the primary to what we start to see as our secondary branching being established. At this point in time, coming back and making that clean cut now that we've delineated where that vegetative growth is going to occur, starting to pace those so it can heal and the thickening of these branches can start to mesh that seamless transition of taper from the trunk to the primary to the secondary, a necessary evil we're gonna have to deal with tonight and that's what I'm gonna start out with as I'm answering your guys' questions. Then we get to come back to that notion of actually wiring in the shape, okay? Few places to be aware of inside of this when we start to rotate around and we get deep inside of this in here, Jesus, can you see into this right here? Okay, we have this piece right here where it forks and this is a very prominent aspect of this tree that makes it very interesting, I think. Now the fork that goes up is still usable but there is a stump that's produced some, some really small secondaries growing back into the canopy of the tree. And I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna cut that out because we've got some great buds that have popped and then we have secondary growth on the end of this piece that moves up into the canopy. And in that move, I'm also sort of pacing that move with the fact that when we start to look at this other location, we notice that the piece that would be a prominent structural component leaning in that same direction did not produce vegetative buds. Did not produce vegetative buds on this long piece. They shot back near the base. So I don't have that structure that's competing with those pieces. I'm gonna keep more structure than I want tonight. Obviously, let it evolve and continue to make those decisions. A big part of the structural setting is making sure we have more than we ultimately want to end up with and eliminating as we develop those pieces that start to shine as a significant component of what will be our finished tree. Next spring or next fall, we can come back in and make this move again. Spring, point of first flush hardening or fall, we can come back in and make these moves. Anyways, I'm gonna open it up to questions as I clean up these cuts and Jesus and Eve will be on the detail cams to show you guys what I'm doing. Right, we have quite a few. Um, so Michael wants to know, isn't wiring best when the leaves are hardening, when vascular tissue is growing? So we get such a minimal, and, and again, I, I need everybody to really understand what happened to this tree to understand why we're doing this work at this time of year. And the, the maximizing our deciduous material means trying to do the work at a point in time where we can get the highest quality product out of the action that we take. So. 
Okay, that's fine. So we pruned this tree back and stumped it when we repotted it, which means we had to let the tree actually produce that vegetative growth, and we needed that vegetative growth to become strong and well attached. A characteristic of quince, whether it be Canameles, whether it be Chojubai, or whether it be Pseudocydonia, or what we're dealing with tonight, the true Cydonia, or the only true quince that we work with, one of the characteristics of their new growth is it comes off, it breaks off very, very easily. And for anybody that's tried to handle Chinese quince or regular quince or the new growth on Japanese quince, whether it's Chojubai or the, regular, uh, the straight um, uh, Canameles japonica, is that new growth is extremely fragile. So if I came back when this technically hardened off, quote unquote, then I would have probably torn off most of these branches. There are species or there are times. Say for example, you've done this work, it's recovered, you come back next year. It hasn't overly thickened or you're saying if I let it thicken anymore, I'm gonna have a problem. Sure, after it hardens off, you've already got great attachment from the growth generated this year. You could do this work next year, but you are gonna have the additional thickening, which we get a far greater amount of vascular tissue produced in the fall than we do in the spring. Absolutely a time that you could come back to it. On this tree with this large of leaves, the fact that we haven't reduced the leaf mass and that we're just now setting that initial structure and really building, this is the opportune time to maximize this growing season, take advantage of the fact that I can still add a lot of movement to these branches because they haven't overly thickened and that's why we chose to do this now. We let that initial vegetative growth harden off, secure its junction to the trunk, and now we can come back in and wire without fear of dislodging it. Whereas if we had done it earlier, we probably would have undone a lot of the recovery growth that we got from that initial really strong action on the tree. Uh, Gary wants to know, and this is from your whiteboard discussion, for the last timing of work, should the leaves have fallen or just lost the green color and still be on the tree just in the yellow-red state? So the color should be receding, and you'll start to see the edges of some of those leaves start to get crunchy and crinkled up. Some of them will be falling. They'll be very easy to remove. You may have to take action on the, tr on the leaves that are the most delayed. There it is. But... When we're talking about that scope of work, we are talking about the point where it's reabsorbed its pigmentation, but it has not fully defoliated yet because we wanna be doing it while it's still distributing all of that magnesium, nitrogen, and iron, which make up the backbones of the chlorophyll or the green coloration in the tree. We want that to diffuse through all of those cells to even out that concentration. And that diffusion takes a couple weeks after the leaves fall off of the tree. If we do it at the front end, it's able to compartmentalize those cuts. It's able to distribute that energy, the iron, magnesium, and the uh, nitrogen. And we start to see uh, the ability for the tree to respond. If we wait too late, it's already distributed. It's moved into dormancy. Now we open up those cuts. The compartmentalization process is far more difficult on our deciduous. So we want to hit it right as that color is nearing the end of it. And we start to see the leaves absizing from the tree naturally. Let's see, next up is um, Eric wants to know, when is the best time to trunk chop down to a stump? So there's two times really in the year that we can perform that action. And it depends on, and this is where I drew the, this is where I drew that line of high water mobility or low water mobility. And when we talk about Japanese maple, we know if we trunk chop before it pushes its leaves out of its buds in the spring, we're gonna get excessive bleeding and that bleeding means it's gonna be taking sugars that are destined for production and expansion of the vegetative mass. We're gonna be eliminating those in that big push of water with that high water mobility. So in those instances where we have high water mobility species, and again, I've seen this happen. We had it happening on a beach. If you guys look at the structural wiring video on Mariah Live's uh, archive or library, if you look at that uh, structural wiring video, you'll notice that that beach, when we're doing the wiring, as it's getting ready to push out in the spring, it's actually bleeding. And that was a shock to me. I had never seen a deciduous tree bleed like that before uh, outside of a Japanese maple. And it made me aware that certain trees at certain stages of their life, particularly young trees, nursery stock trees, species outside of our Japanese maple are high water mobility to a degree that they can bleed too. I pulled back on the pruning of that uh, beach as a result of seeing that bleeding. Never had any issue as a result of it, but definitely the response to that tree showing moisture oozing out of those cut sites was a warning to me that if I continued further, I could deplete the tree of resources, and I did not want to do that. Um. So, oh, uh, so let me answer that question. So if high water mobility, if we see bleeding, we're gonna wait till the first flush hardens and do a big chop. 
We'll have recuperated the energy. We know that we have a tree in a positive and we're in a vegetative state of growth, so we wait till that first hardening. For low water mobility, we cut it, we do a little test sample, we don't see bleeding, we can do it prior to the buds pushing. That is the very best time for the most vigorous vegetative push out. That's what we did on this quince. It's what we also did on the pomegranate that we repotted in 2018 on the live stream. David wants to know if deciduous trees are wired in the fall, is there a required number of weeks for the tree to heal before winter shut down? So if we're wiring correctly, we should not have God, this is tough to get into. If we're wiring appropriately, we should not have healing or, or the necessity for healing or damage to take place. Now that's easy to say, and then all of a sudden we break a branch and we're like, ah, oh, geez, I broke a branch, what's gonna happen? That branch breaking at the beginning of fall is the best time to break a branch because you have nothing but vascular tissue coming to replace and repair that break. But we definitely want to be doing it prior to any color change taking place. Any yellowing leaves that you're seeing is probably shading more than anything. They're all at the base. Whereas when we see the color change happen, typically it starts to happen at the tips. But when, we, when we're looking at that, we want to be doing it early in the fall prior to the big movement of vascular resources and that beefing up of the branches so that we have that ease of, of wiring and adding movement and we take advantage of that vascular growth as a big part of that uh, choice to choose that season. Um, <laughs> David wants to know if deciduous trees are, oh wait, did I already ask this question? Sorry, I have so many right now. Um, did it... Ben wants to know, would you consider Gary Oak to be low water mobility? Low water mobility, for sure, for sure. Very drought tolerant deciduous species. And most of, I'm gonna say most, if not all, I've never seen a Quercus bleed. I've never seen a hornbeam bleed. That's not to say that they won't, or a really young tree with, uh, that hasn't had the impact of the environment clogging up its vascular transport. It's not to say that they wouldn't, but I've never seen that. And I would consider hornbeam, I would consider Quercus or, or deciduous oaks to be a low water mobility and really safe to be pruning prior to the push of buds. And in fact, I would consider that a primary time to do some of that pruning, particularly if we're trying to develop ramification and push the strength from that tip and that big bud at the tip back to all those small buds and latent buds back on that branch prior to that bud push. It's how we get ramification to grow that year. Uh, Gary wants to know, how much will the leaf size on this get reduced over the years once the tree is in refinement? That's a great question. So the leaf size on this, and if anybody has seen the feature piece of content that we did on partial defoliation, secondary branch building, we had a Chinese quince that had these big massive leaves. And we cut those big massive leaves down by two thirds after that first flush had hardened to stimulate not only the reduction of that and light and air getting into the interior, but also the highest chance by cutting down on that sugar starch production of another flush of ramification occurring and it worked beautifully. And that second flush of ramification, having a smaller leaf mass, because we reduced that leaf size by two thirds, produced inherently smaller leaves. Those leaves on that Chinese quince went from this big to being that big, just by that partial defoliation. And in doing that with this, we can also accomplish that same thing. Now, right now, I want this big leaf mass. I want as much photosynthetic surface area to add meat because I'm establishing structure on this tree. And this is really where we get into what what stage of the bonsai creation process? Are we in structural? Are we in secondary? Are we in tertiary, right? Are we in development? Are we in secondary? Are we in refinement? These are synonyms, right? Primary structure, development. Secondary, tertiary structure, refinement. We're in development, we're working on primary. We're healing, we're transitioning, we're setting those initial scaffolding pieces that are gonna carry all of our branching on this design. I wanna leave this leaf mass to add as much tissue to thicken that up, heal those wounds, ease those transitions from those stumps to those new vegetative pieces of growth. And so the more surface area I have over the course of this fall, the more sugars and starches produced, the more the vascular system loads up on those sugars and starches, and the more we see that cambio layer cellularly divide and generate tissue in those branches. Uh, Kim wants to know how soon she could do a repot of her trident forest in the spring. Um, I would say the safest thing to say is when you see the buds swell, 
If you have winter protection, you can start, once you hit the shortest day of the year, you can start from that point repotting as a good indication. The shortest day of the year is December 21st. We start repotting pines the first week of January. So we've never had an issue. We've always been quite successful with that, but we have to protect them when it's that early in the season. When you see the buds swell, oftentimes we're into March or April, depending where you are in North America. And obviously the Southern hemisphere would be a little bit different. But when we start to see those buds swell, we know that we have a finite amount of time before we get vegetative growth and we're out of the repotting phase. You can do it early if you can protect. Wait till you actually have the environmental conditions and the tree telling you, I'm getting ready to grow if you don't have winter facilities to be able to prevent freezing after that repot. Let's see, still have a lot in the pipeline. Um, Eric wants to know, why re-wound and paste the dry cut? Is it to make it heal smoother? Make it heal smoother and to keep the core, that core wood. So when we come back to this, right, this core wood is gonna deteriorate over the course of time. It's gonna get soft, it's gonna get pithy. Water, ultraviolet rays, etc. break this down. All of us have seen those deciduous wounds that roll to a degree and stop. And we say, why does that wound stop? Well, that wound stops because that core amount of tissue has lost all of its integrity and it's actually imbibing water from the callus tissue that's rolling over it. And we lose that solid backbone. So if I can preserve that core wood, I maintain my scaffolding for the callus to roll over. So in a situation like this where I didn't paste, I'm just gonna take my knife and I'm gonna come back in here and I'm just gonna open up that really nice soft green tissue, okay? And you're gonna see where it actually has receded a little bit and compartmentalized some of that, uh, that decay. So I'm just gonna come back in here and just make a nice, really nice sharp rewound, and I'm gonna get down to this green tissue. You see this green and white tissue here? I want all of this, and notice how I'm cutting into the actual wound. I'm not cutting away from it. If I cut away from it, I run the risk of tearing that tissue, and if I tear that tissue, it's not gonna produce really beautiful callus or new tissue scarring that's gonna give rise to that callus formation. So I always wanna cut into it, so I'm adjusting my knife to cut into it, and once I've opened up, I got a little bit of a bridge here where I don't have that, I'm just gonna go a little bit deeper. Again, cutting into it and opening that up, and I don't even mind that I have a little bit of protrusion because that's gonna roll up over that, it's gonna stay quite thin instead of getting big and bulky. If I can go a little bit flatter, I can ensure that it's gonna be a much smoother, cleaner transition, but you can see how that white tissue is already starting to yellow a little bit, it will orange. This is oxidation of all of the elements that exist inside of that tissue at the vascular production time of year that are trying to compartmentalize immediately after that wound, trying to compartmentalize as that, those elements oxidize. So I'm just gonna take this, I see that activity in the vascular tissue right now, I'm gonna take my putty, I'm gonna stick it right Right in the middle and again really nice really nice clean application of this you see people handle this stuff very very sloppily I don't like that I like it when we just just cover that tissue to really get that moisture bound in there but we don't want to look at a bunch of callus mate which is the this is called uh, excuse me uh, cut paste we don't want to look at a bunch of cut paste uh, globbed onto our tree, okay? But just doing that, now it can heal very smoothly. And again, coming back into the fall, ideal time to be doing wound work because now that callus is immediately gonna be stimulated to grow. We see that in the oxidation of that fresh tissue we opened up. This is when we get the most vascular production, which means callus is a vascular tissue, trunk girth is a vascular tissue, branch girth is a vascular tissue, and root growth is a vascular tissue. Most root growth happens in the fall season for our trees. They've been set up for it, balance water and oxygen, high leaf mass on a developing tree. We're gonna rebuild this. We're gonna set the stage for next year, but we're taking advantage of the fact that it hasn't accumulated a lot of vac vascular tissue yet. So we can set that structure with these wounds, ease that transition and gain that girth with all the movement we want in that tree. Let's see, next up is Mike. Uh, is there a signal the tree gives you that lets you know that pruning at this time won't trigger a flush of new growth? So I would say when we start to look at the fall season, if we're in a really, really warm area, the chances of pruning at this time of year and getting another flush is, is definitely a realistic concern that we need to have. And so when we start to look at the seasonality and where we're at, we may wait a little bit longer 
if we're farther south or in a southern uh, location in North America so that we're not necessarily running the risk of that. And there's still, if we're in a warm enough area where our trees only go partially deciduous, then we can push this work far later. However, we are missing the boat on taking advantage of that thickening to solidify some of the movement we wanna put into these pieces that we're going to utilize. And if we're in a warmer area, it's not as big a deal if we incite that next flush of growth. But that next flush of growth would also be a product of pruning this tip. And I'm not gonna be pruning this tree tonight. It's gonna to look like a big Medusa's head by the time we're done because by not pruning this tip, I don't stimulate another flush of growth. I'm just giving shape to these and leaving all of the leaf mass on to beef it up. And you'll see as we continue moving forward how I handle the tree at this time of year to specifically avoid that next flush being stimulated. The other thing that I wanna be careful of at the very beginning of the fall season, like on this tree, we just fertilized this last week with a relatively high nitrogen feed, okay? Or, or I would say balanced nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, okay? If I'm, if I'm dealing with a later portion of the fall season, when I get into the mid portion of fall, when I get into late fall, I wanna pull back on that nitrogen and go to a phosphorus, potassium feed and all the trace elements void of nitrogen because nitrogen can incite another flush if we've done any modification to the tips or prune back that tree. So that is one thing that will help us, but also not knocking off those tips right now. And again, if this were in secondary or tertiary, or secondary and refinement phase of development, or that, that phase of the tree's evolution, then I'm not gonna be doing this work right now. Okay, this is very much a structural, how do we create a deciduous tree from a field grown piece, from a nursery stock piece, that we've stump cut and now we get all this growth, we come back right now, wire that out, it's recovered, it's replenished the tree's energy, it's strengthened its junction, and we can give shape to it before it adds the meat over the fall. This is a moment where we can max out our deciduous trees and take advantage of this first year of that transition. Uh, Eric wants to know how deep can wire bite get on the green bark of deciduous trees like Japanese maple before it will cause permanent scarring? Any, any, any wire marks on a Japanese maple will cause permanent scarring. So you don't want to let it get deep at all. And that's one of the disadvantages to a smoother bark deciduous variety like a trident, like a Japanese maple. I try to avoid that entirely. Uh, Gary wants to know if the wire you're putting on tonight will stay on the tree all winter. Um, it depends. It depends. Because we're headed into that really uh, strong growth phase of the deciduous over the course of the fall, I might put this on and I might have to take this off by the end of the fall. It depends on how our fall goes, how warm temperatures are. It also depends on um, how strong this tree is going to be and, and how much vascular growth it adds. It's unpredictable to me. But when we wire our deciduous trees, we always have to be aware of the fact that when we wire them, we've gotta be watching very closely for that expansion. If we're wiring in the beginning of fall, imagine this, I wire this and six weeks later, it's already starting to constrict and dig in. That means that I've got so much vascular growth that I've already started to set that structure six weeks. I could come back, take that wire off, hit it again, and further expand over the last six weeks of fall and all of a sudden I've got so far in a single season. Now for a lot of us with a lot of trees in our collection that's gonna be very difficult to keep up with and you're saying, oh my gosh, I don't want that. But when we think about our goals in bonsai, isn't our goal in bonsai to be maximizing the amount of time that we bring about the quality in the tree? If you say, yeah, no, actually that sounds quite right. I would love to see this thing just flourish and take off and rage and develop and evolve. Well, then this is a great time of year to be able to take advantage of what the tree can do. And if you can put this kind of energy into one single tree, one single deciduous piece that you're trying to evolve, that you did the big structural cut back on, you've got that big vegetative flush, then that tree has taken massive leaps and strides by hitting this time of year. You don't need to apply this to all your trees, but it is a technique you can utilize, and if you're aware of it, you can choose when you put this to use. Gary wants to know, what made you repot and cut it back at the same time rather than waiting for the tree to recover from the repot before doing the cutback at a later time? So generally when we talk about deciduous, much like when we talk about other trees, we have to understand their epicenter of energy. And deciduous trees, their epicenter of energy is in their vascular system, very much like our elongating species. So when we get that vascular system really built up with sugars and starches, and this tree was hugely healthy coming out of the healing in bed, I know I have the resources 
to make that uh, decision on the structure as well as on the root system and have it respond very positively, okay? But if we're dealing with a deciduous tree that's further along in refinement, a deciduous tree that doesn't have vigorous growth, a deciduous tree that was lacking some health, then we don't pull on that reserve because that lack of health or that further degree of refinement means we've started to constrict the strength of that tree. And we see this in a lot of nursery stock material that's pot bound or it's been in the nursery container or it's in ill health in the back 30 of, of, of the nursery that we source some of our more dilapidated material from that's great for bonsai and they can't sell it because it looks like crap, right? Those kinds of trees, we would probably do the repot first, replenish that root system. Chances are it's container bound, which acts much like a bonsai tree in a nursery container. It gets fully bound up. We don't have the energy, we don't have the space. We do that repot without doing any work on the branches. We recover the health. Then we come back to the branches after the first flush hardens or maybe we even wait till the following spring. But for a tree that is just ragingly vigorous and has all of that built up, it can take this kind of work. And the reason it can is because deciduous trees are a very thin, large surface area solar panel. They have a very thin waxy cuticle, so they lose water rapidly. They don't have that prevention, which is why they don't grow in the hottest, driest regions of the world. They grow where there's water available. That high water mobility means they can move sugars and starches to vegetative growth. They can move sugars and starches to replenish the root system. And we distribute that across that tree, getting some root growth, some vegetative growth, but we can make that big decision to set them in the bonsai path in that singular move if they have that vigor built up. So any lack of vigor, we can't perform that. Massively vigorous deciduous tree, that first move into the container and a, re and a regeneration of the structure, we can do that at once if it's showing that kind of vigor. Okay, next up, David um, wants to know, is the reason we don't prune deciduous in early fall, um, well, is the reason we do not prune deciduous in early fall until leaf color change or leaf drop is to allow the tree to get the most energy from the foliage? Definitely to allow the tree to get the most energy, but also we don't want to incite a second flush at this time of year where we're already going into shorter daylight length, cooler temperatures with a lower metabolic activity, and this foliar mass is contributing to sugar starch loading that creates the vascular tissue, which gives us winter tolerance, but also sets us up for growth next year, right? And so when we start to look at this, are there ways that you could manipulate that system to actually find a purpose for pruning in the early fall on a really refined tree to decrease the amount of vascular tissue it produces to keep the finer twigs really fine? Absolutely, and this is where you would see in older Japanese magazines, the palmatum, Acer palmatum, Japanese maple has these fingers. You'll see in some magazines where they cut all those fingers off and just leave the palm of the leaf to decrease the photosynthetic surface area, which keeps the finer branches very small and fine and twiggy, okay? But by decreasing that photosynthetic surface area, those trees are also protected over the winter because they can't accumulate the same amount of sugars and starches, which does decrease the thickening at the twig tip, which makes it more refinable, but more refined also means more susceptible to winter damage. The finer and finer a tree gets, the more and more it needs protection as a result of that constricted root space and the decrease of sugar starch production with the techniques that we apply. So to be safe and also to know we have techniques in the spring in that early period of vegetative flush with the pinching model, the partial defoliation after the first flush hardens off, we can offset any accumulation of energy that happens in the fall. And I would say as a general practice, don't prune your trees in early fall because you don't want that second flush, the evacuation of sugars and starches, and the decreased accumulation of resources. That's not what we're going for, for a sustainable bonsai approach. And that's also why you don't see that technique of the fingers of palmatum cut off in magazines any longer in the modernized bonsai approach. They've learned this is dangerous. We need to be careful with this. Um, Bill says he has a few saplings in a pot from a club auction. Um, something ate all the leaves on the stems. I assume these are deciduous based on what we're, based on our stream tonight. Mm. Um, his question is what will happen to them this late in the season? Chances are that if, if you have warm enough temperatures, they'll push out another flush of growth. Now, if it's cool where you're at, there's a strong chance that the tree has gotten sugars and starches from that leaf mass being on it and it won't take any action at all. It'll have swollen buds, they'll stay there and it'll probably push out next spring. So it hinges on daylight length and temperature and your relationship in terms of proximity to the, to the equator. The farther south you go, the more likely it's gonna push out. The farther north you go, the more likely it's gonna stay there until next spring. 
Uh, Gary and Ralph both wanted to know, um, can you please explain how close you are cutting back the old thick branches to the transition point with the new thin growth? Do we need to leave some room for dieback or close all the way for a smooth transition? Great question. Okay. Now, when we do that big cut, and this is really similar to the way that we handled the pomegranate when we came back and readdressed those big cuts and did the secondary wiring of all that vegetative growth that was produced. Now, we waited a full year on the pomegranate. This quince, being that it's such a vigorous species and these massive leaves giving us that recovery production of sugars and starches is being worked on far sooner, almost a, a year, uh, a little under a year, eight months sooner than that pomegranate was, okay? But when we start to talk about that, this cutback right here, and Jesus, can you just kind of focus in on this just so they can get an idea of proximity, okay? This cutback here is a perpendicular cutback. So I've got my branch running here and I'm cutting perpendicular to the branch. So I'm not cutting diagonal here uh, against this shoulder because that will cause a weakening of this tissue. That's where we see that branch break off. I want a perpendicular cut to the line of the structural branch and I want it to be right against the top of the shoulder of where that shoot emerges. So if I take the bulk out of this cut paste right here, what you'll see is that it's right up against the shoulder of that shoot as it emerges to try and get that healing, to move that transition of taper smoothly into the growth of this branch. That is my priority when I make that cut this second time. First cut, I made it, I didn't know where growth was gonna be produced. Growth is produced, I see it now. Now I make a clean perpendicular cut right up against the shoulder of the shoot. I'm cutting that back to. I, I clean it up with my knife. I, I paste it with cut paste, the putty, to hold that moisture in and encourage healing. And we're off and running in terms of the development of that next sort of iteration of scar tissue that should smooth out that transition from this big piece to this smaller secondary piece that's occurred. Um. Vern wants to know if you could please clarify the degree of water mobility on pomegranate and elm. So, I mean, I think when we talk about both of those species, and again, just understand that into the deciduous model, when we look at deciduous, broadleafed evergreen, and conifer, deciduous is higher, wa highest water mobility, conifer is lowest water mobility, okay? But inside of deciduous, you've got deciduous that will literally physically bleed water in the spring season. This is the Japanese maple moving water to transport those stored sugars and starches throughout the trunk, throughout the roots, throughout the branches, out to those growing tips to start the vegetative growth process. And we cut that, and that water with all of those stored sugars and starches bleeds out of that wound site. That is the highest degree of water mobility in all of bone site. Okay? Now, when we start to look at a little bit drier, still higher water mobility in terms of deciduous, broadleaf evergreen, and conifer, but inside of that high water mobility of deciduous, the trees that will not bleed when we cut them with all that stored sugar and starch prior to bud push in the spring, these are things like elms, pomegranates, hornbeams. Most of our deciduous trees will not take on that behavior. But when a tree is very young and has very clean, open cellular structure in the xylem, sometimes that can be moving water so rapidly, whereas an old tree has a lot of contaminants that get dumped into the core and that decreases the amount of water moved. Or something like a Japanese maple where it's always going to be open and always going to bleed. We start to see trees that are not going to bleed and we can take action before they push buds. Uh, Danny wants to know if you'll be fertilizing after this work. So I will be fertilizing again, but I will need to be fertilizing with a low or no nitrogen fertilizer from this point forward. Gary wants to know, would this discussion or timing of work be applicable to broadleaf evergreens like boxwood or Japanese holly? So this is an interesting discussion because when we talk about, and if we talk about, and this is true across the board, if we're talking about conifers, broadleafed evergreens, or we're talking deciduous, to set the structure in the early fall before we get that big massive push of vascular growth that thickens up all those branches, then we absolutely take advantage of the timing of the tree to perform the action that helps us set the structure the fastest, and we take advantage of the tree at a point where it's the softest and the thinnest that we can take action on in that branching structure because we know anything that exists on this tree, if we don't take action on its shape now, it's only gonna get thicker. Every branch thickens over the fall season. There's no way to stop that from happening, okay? So that is true for broadleaf, evergreen, deciduous, or conifer. Now, what we need to be aware of is in our handling of broadleaf, evergreen, deciduous, or conifer, are we making the mistake of pruning, 
removing that hormone content at the tip, which then causes the tree to compartmentalize, have to redistribute hormones and send out new growth to guide that process. And if we're doing that, that's not an action we wanna take on our broadleafed evergreens and it's not an action we wanna take on our deciduous. Definitively an action we can take on our conifers, but we also understand the more foliage we remove, the less winter hardiness we have, and so we need to understand that there's a balance between over-reduction and a susceptibility in winter versus uh, a mild reduction and still it being capable of enduring winter conditions in our areas. Rafi would like you to give us an idea about your vision to the final design of I don't, this tree. I don't, and this is, this, is, this is kind of one of those interesting moments in a deciduous piece. So what I'm doing as I'm talking to you guys, I've made the big cuts. I'll come back and show you. I have to get some of these branches out of the way to get to some of these pieces. I've taken off a few uh, basally growing shoots. Um, I've taken off a few of these weaker pieces down along the bottom. This will not incite a flush of growth because I still have all of these leaves inta intact and these tips intact. I'm not at all worried about small minor reductions of entire branches. But I'm wiring this because I need to get some of these out of the way. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to, with a very basic fundamental concept, place the branches in the direction they need to be and focus on this initial point, the shoulder as it originates from that thicker stump, its position, shape, angle, and that initial movement that's put into that branch. And this is really where the design process begins for deciduous. Now I feel very comfortable with my front. I've eliminated a, a structural piece in here that I felt was clogging up the structure. And my assumption is that my tree is gonna move from left to right really building the apex over in this direction of the tree as just my general approach to the trunk line, my predominantly dominant apical region right here. And that's what allows me to sort of guide and understand the initial movement that I'm putting into these pieces. But I know as this thickens, I'm only gonna be using the first 30% of any of these big long pieces as the sustainable, usable portion of growth. And over the course of time, these will be cut back Finer branches will push as a result of that cutback when we transition from that structural to the secondary. Then we're gonna cut those pieces back from the secondary to the tertiary. So my priority is on this initial direction for that rough design concept and that initial movement for the usable piece that actually is gonna be seen in my final tree. Doesn't mean that I'm not gonna carry the movement out farther because who knows? Maybe this develops and you want all of this movement and this thickness and this length. You don't know what your concept for this tree is gonna be when we're dealing with such raw stock. So work the whole branch as if you're gonna keep it. But more likely than not, we're only gonna be using a very small portion of this and that's really where we focus on getting exactly what we want and the reason that we're doing it right now where they're stable and connected well but they haven't totally thickened yet over the fall season. Um, Peter is in Queensland, Australia. He's got a large clump style Japanese maple. Mm. Um, he lifted it from his grow bed. It's now growing very vigorously, has put out multiple shoots at most locations. Um, it was only lifted a few weeks prior to the end of winter. So should he leave those surplus shoots for energy creation, remove them now or leave until later until late spring or summer? So because he's in the Southern hemisphere and now we're dealing with fall in the Northern hemisphere, Peter's dealing with spring in the Southern hemisphere. And we know that if we prune Japanese maple right now, it's gonna heavily bleed. You don't want any depletion of your sugar starch loading in that tree prior to getting it to push out roots and recover from that digging operation. I would hold off on pruning the next time that you would come back to pruning that Japanese maple in the Southern Hemisphere would be after that first flush hardens, energy is reaccumulated, the risk of bleeding is no longer present in that tree. We can do some moves there and that gives us time for those sugars and starches that aren't being bled out of the tree as a result of not cutting now to contribute to that root reproduction and the reestablishment of that tree. And you can read its reaction to the lifting process by letting it go and then coming back and addressing it. Uh, Jesse says, because of fall being a vascular growth time, would air layering deciduous work? He's thought about it, but hasn't tried it. Interesting that you uh, asked that question, Jesse, because um, we recently tried some air layers, uh, and, and I say recently as in like last weekend with class, we recently tried some air layers on a number of different species in the fall season, just to see. Typically we say, 
In the northern hemisphere, as that first flush hardens, we then air layer that first flush and that new foliage mass is gonna be pulling in sugars and starches and we're gonna accumulate that uh, callus and then the new root production. We've got the time for the roots to expand and then we can potentially, if it all goes well, separate in the fall or wait until next year if we need more root growth, okay? So this is standard course of action concept for air layering. But if you think about the fact that vascular growth is happening in the fall, if we air layer now, how much better is that callus production? How much more vigorous is it? And what is the time frame? Do we compress it doing it at this point where not only callus, but also root formation is at its highest functionality? I don't know. I've never seen it done in Japan in the fall. We tried it on a number of trees. I see where your logic is at. I also agree with where that experiment has the opportunity to potentially bear fruit. And I'll let you know how it goes with the experiment that we've taken. I can't say how it will respond yet. I don't know. Danny says, um, this is from a little while ago, you were using cutters on some stumps and a saw on others. Can you explain why? Yeah, so basically what I got into is the saw was uh, going to damage the secondary shoots that I wanted to use for the structure of the tree. So I had so much in such a small space, I just said, the heck with it, I'll go with my cutters. The problem with the cutters, whenever we talk about, and I use a, a knob cutter when I go in big on those pieces so that I get just a little bit of uh, inset growth, but I also use it because I can pull back a little bit on that stump. So when we think about knob cutters, if I wanna cut right up against the shoulder of that branch, Okay? If I'm using my knob cutters, I can pull back a little bit and I can make that cut. And now what I've got is I've got the depth of that cut right at the point where I want it. I can use my razor blade to come back and shave off those high points on the outside of the cut to actually get the depth that I want. Because we know that our concave cutters and our knob cutters are gonna crush a lot of the tissue. And this means that we're not gonna get great healing on the tree, which is where we use the saw and then clean up the edge of the saw. But I can strategically, in areas where the saw can't get into, it's pre precarious, it could do damage, I can use a knob cutter or a concave cutter and come back in and clean. I just have to pull back a little bit in terms of the depth that I cut at, knowing that that's gonna be far deeper in the center than it is on the edges, and we can cut those edges to create that nice, clean, flat, or just a slight concavity to that cut. Okay, now let me walk you guys through what I'm doing here and then we can continue with the questions, okay? So basically what I've done is I'm putting wire on, on the, the structural pieces and as we talk about in deciduous, deciduous are, are really guided in terms of their growth by cytokinin. We talk about conifers and this vertical triangular growth being guided by the presence of auxin as the hormone that controls that vertical elongating growth. Deciduous, as they mature, form more of a rounded or a billowing canopy. And that is because cytokinin is the predominant hormone that exists in the branching and tips of the deciduous model, which causes it to spread out and distribute in secondary and tertiary branching its energy. And so when we think about that, that up and out growth habit of deciduous is a very, very strong representation of how they naturally grow up and out, meaning they start out searching for the light with a little bit of auxin. Pretty soon, cytokinin takes over, causes secondary tertiary branching in a lateral formation, and that's what builds the up and out model, okay? So my initial moves, as you saw on the pomegranate, and as you see, when you look at a lot of deciduous natural models and representations, say the Japanese maples out of Japan, a lot of the naturally worked Chinese, or uh, excuse me, trident maples that don't abide by the pine style applied to a deciduous, when you see a really beautiful Chinese quince, when you see a uh, a, a chojubai, when you see a hornbeam, when you see a beach, they all have this up out model of shape and aesthetic. And that's what I'm trying to achieve. Even in a tree of this scale, ultimately what I see this tree having is this really billowy, informal nature where I divide the pads, quote unquote, by the change in the contour of that exterior silhouette, that that initial branch movement up and out already exists in my structure, which I'm taking uh, keys and clues from, the up and out of each of these structural branches indicative of that, continuing on that process, each one of these pieces, up and out, up and out as that guiding light. Now I'm also trying to maximize the amount of movement and interest I get through these pieces because when we deal with a really thin piece, when we deal with this thin piece and we put all this radical movement in it, you guys might say, well, there's not radical movement here. Initially, there was radical movement in this whip that was placed into the ground. However, 
as this very thin piece that we're starting with starts to thicken, the radical nature of these bins starts to be softened by that thickening process. If we start out off with this really delicate kind of movement, then all of a sudden what happens as it thickens is it turns into a straight piece. So we want to add really dramatic pieces of movement to it. As it thickens, it's going to soften it, and that's how we preserve the movement we put in in this initial structural setting while they're still very thin and still very young. And again, this is exactly why I'm doing this scope of work right now in the fall. If I have a break, I'm going to have vascular productivity that's going to be able to mend that damage. But I also have twigs that are thin enough right now that I can put this dramatic movement into them, and they're going to thicken on that, but I have the ability to put it in them while they're this thin. If I waited till next spring or after the first flush next year, it will have hardened off its growth, expanded its vascular tissue with this massive leaf mass, and become thick enough that the movement I can put into them next year is going to be less than what I can put into them right now at this pivotal time of year. And this is why fall is so magical for deciduous trees in development to take advantage and really set that structure and movement in a way that's going to give that tree an accentuated amount of quality and value as it evolves as a bonsai. Danny um, wants to know uh, why you are using aluminum wire tonight. Yeah, great question. So we talk about the fact that we could use and get away with uh, quite successfully the use of copper on deciduous trees, but when we deal with trees that don't have a very thick bark, copper can be a little bit abrasive, cause a little bit of scarring. We can overcome that by paper wrapping the copper, absolutely. But if, if we have really thin branches like we have on this quince, then the, the mechanical advantage of copper to set the structure is not nearly as functional. So if I've got thin branches, I'm not going to choose that abrasive copper that I have to take an approach like paper coating the copper to soften it for the bark so it doesn't damage and leave a scar like we did on the Stewardia stream that we did in 2017. I'm going to go ahead with these thin branches and use aluminum. I've got enough holding power because the branches are so young. And this is really where aluminum is just absolutely king in setting that initial structure. Gives us the very best of all worlds. I'm not setting branches that are so thick because I, I basically stump cut this back to very short sections that I'm not going to move with big thick wire. So now I come back with aluminum and just these small delicate branches. It's easier to apply. It's got plenty of holding power. It's not as abrasive. I don't have to take extra action. It's efficient. It's functional. It's aesthetically pleasing. I'm good to go with aluminum. Cool. And then kind of piggybacking on that, Paul had kind of asked the same thing about what makes you go with one type over the other. Yeah. So are there anything else you'd add about specific deciduous trees needing so, copper? Yeah. So I think when you start moving really big structural pieces that have been on the tree for a while. So say, for example, these structural pieces were a little bit thinner and they had mobility. I would absolutely love to take this branch and bend it. The chances of me being able to bend this slim to none at the thickness that it's established right now. But if I had a little bit thinner structural piece here, I could absolutely use copper and the physical holding force of copper superior to aluminum, use a smaller gauge to accomplish that big bend, paper coat it to protect the bark and get the copper's holding impact to really functionally move bigger pieces of structure in this deciduous tree. And you saw this, you've seen this on um, the, the pomegranate that had really rigid branches uh, and a thicker bark. You saw this on uh, the linden that we did that had big, thick, gnarly uh, branches on it and we used that copper to move that. You saw it on the stewardia where we were moving the structural pieces that had a lot more maturity on it. But this, we're just doing these new pieces that have emerged this year and this is where aluminum is really functional. So if you need the holding power, you need the mechanical advantage, copper is always going to be the way. If you can do it with aluminum in this initial styling on thinner branches, by all means take advantage of it. Okay, next up is Eric. Um, to avoid wire bite, how do you know when to take the wire off? Because he usually uses wire bite as his cue. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think that it's impossible uh, and I've come to this conclusion after, and again, you guys have probably experienced it on the stream, we are dealing with more deciduous trees at Mirai right now than ever before. We've worked deciduous trees uh, uh, to a large degree this year, and the reason that I've avoided them, in all honesty, at Mirai is just simply a, a logistical aspect of Mirai, and that is we have a lot of deer. Putting up a fence around Mirai would not only be cost prohibited, but also it would ruin the aesthetic of the garden, um, and, and 
uh, not, it's not where I want to head. And so we're starting to look at different methodologies that we utilize to protect our trees from deer. And in, in the deciduous model, as we find those solutions, then we're going to be working more and more with deciduous trees. But uh, what was the question? Oh, why are biting in? There yeah. we go. But one of the other things about deciduous trees that has prevented us from really focusing on them at Mirai was the fact that you have to be so on top of them to prevent that wire from digging in and completely ruining a tree at a very young age. And that is a big, big commitment that we have to understand we're taking on when we move into the deciduous model. If we choose to put wire on that tree, which is, I think, a necessary part of any great tree, is wiring in the shape and taking advantage of the tool we have to create that interesting movement and structure. But as a result, when it starts to get tight, I'm already knowing that if I see it get tight in one area, it's digging into another area. And if we're proactive about recognizing tightness, tightness being the wire starting to look like there's no space, there's no flexibility inside of the wire and branch, that means that we're, we have a place that's biting in on the tree somewhere. Bigger the leaf, the more vascular production we get. The bigger the leaf, it means the, or, or the areas where we have more leaves, the faster it's gonna be growing. So I use tight, as my reference, whereas in trees that actually are allowed to bite, I use the biting process. And that's kind of where I draw the line. You will have wire scars in every deciduous tree that you create. No matter how hard you try, it will happen. But the sooner you catch it, and the more that you identify tightness as an indicator to look through the rest of the tree, the sooner you'll be able to curtail it. And just a few wire scars here and there are not gonna be the end of a deciduous tree. Okay, so I'm working on, working, really working and working hard on trying to figure this out. Now, I have this trunk, and Jesus, can you focus in here just so people get an idea of the, the, the field? Okay, I have this trunk that exists in the foreground, and trunk, branch, whatever you wanna call it, exists in the foreground. Will this be on the tree for the rest of its life? I don't know yet. I don't, I don't know yet, okay? But I have it, and so I'm gonna use it. If this is gonna exist, my apical region is actually gonna be coming from back in here, okay? Because this is the continuation. If not this piece, then it'll be this piece that's moving to the right side of the tree. So what that means is this may have to be shorter in the future, or I'm gonna keep these branches very short so that they're a foreground branch with an apical region and a background piece to have all of those fields in the dimension of the tree covered, and again, I really wanna stress at this point, don't try to design a finished tree right now. Give every branch that has the potential to be functional the opportunity to show you what it has and what it can be. Because in the deciduous model, each of these branches is gonna take on a different load, different growth rate, different aesthetic. We're putting a lot of movement into it. Let the tree take on a lot of that design lift. Give it a direction, have that ethos to the design up and out, if you will, or down and out if you're going to mimic the conifer form and deciduous, and then let it do its job. Let it respond to your direction. Let it grow as it's going to in the areas. Let it continue to carry the load. I encourage you guys, and I push you in this direction. It's necessary to understand that you don't have to control everything, and in fact, if you take a back seat or a minor role and you let the tree carry the majority of the load, you're gonna get farther, faster, with a better product at the end. I'm giving it a boost, I'm gonna remove myself. It's got more than I need, I know that, but what's it gonna do for me when I let it take on the majority of the decision making? It's gonna be better than I could have planned. Let's see here. Um, so this pot that this is in, um, Jesse had wanted to know, is that Stone Monkey? Stone Monkey. Andrew cool. Pearson, yeah. Very nice. Yes, um, very, very nice indeed. We, if you guys haven't seen his wares on the Mariah Web Store, check them out, particularly in preparation for next spring. Don't wait till next spring to be looking for containers for your trees. If you know what you're gonna be repotting, start the process now, because in that proactive search, you're gonna be far more ahead and, and have far more options now than you are next spring. The web store has been really starting to pick up in terms of container sales. I'm impressed by that. It means people are becoming proactive about their bonsai approach. I think that's necessary. It's how we get on top of things. We already have our orders in from a majority of our ceramic distributors to have our, our containers here before we start to round the corner into spring. We should have all of our containers by the end of the year at Mirai. 
Um, Marsha says she knows that you don't like to cage wire, but to reduce likelihood of scarring, you don't recommend cage wiring on smooth bark. I don't tubers? recommend cage wiring because it doesn't allow you to get that tight movement. You need contact because the branch doesn't want to go where you want it to go. It wants to efficiently go where it wants to go. And we're trying to say, no, don't grow like this, grow like this, right? In order to get that movement and have that movement be tight, so when the tree thickens, that movement is preserved, we need to have contact. But when we have contact, we need to pay attention to the thickening process. And in the fall, that's when thickening happens the fastest. So we've got to be extra on point to make sure that we're taking advantage and being aware of the pitfalls of wiring right now. But again, if I put wire on this now, it's going to take me, if I weren't talking to you guys and we weren't educating about this, this would be a 10 to 15 minute scope of work for me. Okay, 15 minutes, I'm done. I set it back outside. I will look at it four weeks from now. Set a reminder in my phone actually is what I've learned to do at Mariah to be able to keep up with the deciduous. Gives me a beep, I go take a look, it's still not tight, two more weeks, set a reminder, right? But we're looking at it, we're taking advantage of the fall vascular season. When it gets tight, I take it off, I wire it again. Take it off, 15 minutes to take it off, 15, 20 minutes to wire it again. That means I've got two shapings where I can accentuate and really maximize that movement in the fall season. Maybe it doesn't thicken that much and I don't have to unwire it this fall and I have to look next spring and set my reminders for next spring. But taking advantage of it is what allows us to take this tree from here to here. Not, not to here, but to here, as far as it can go this year. And that's really taking advantage and utilizing the seasons to the best benefit of the tree's evolution. Um, Jeff says it was really hot in Southern California a couple weeks ago. He missed watering for a day. Two deciduous trees in development got fried. 70 to 90% of the leaves dried out and are now dying. Any recommendations on what he can do this fall to help them recover and come back? Yeah. So, and this is funny because this question has um, been on the, um, we've had questions on the live Q&As about this same thing happening. And I'm actually dealing with what I think is this same scenario happening to a coast live oak um, with a, a student at Mirai. And when we have a tree experience, a really uh, dramatic issue with water drying out, et cetera, the benefit of it is, is a tree sheds its leaves to preserve itself. A deciduous, a broadleaf evergreen, they'll shed their leaves, right? But they still have all the stored sugars and starches if we've handled them correctly and they've got a good balance of water and oxygen, they have that health of that root system, they will recover. Here's the biggest thing you need to be aware of. When a deciduous tree sheds its leaves, if it continues to be hot, that trunk is now open and susceptible to sunburn. So we want it to have sun to stimulate the buds, but we don't want that trunk to burn because then we'll have dead wood and we'll have a de degradation of some pieces of the tree. So we would want to keep it out of intense sun, but give it that nice, soft, subtle morning sun to stimulate that bud growth. And if your tree is healthy, it will recover and respond with another flush. Now that that flush is being pushed in the fall, it's going to decrease winter hardiness. In Southern California, that's not an issue for you unless you guys do get an unseasonable freeze. In that case, that's a tree you would pull in and not allow to freeze over the winter season. I have no doubt it'll come back. Next up is Eric. Um, and I'm sure you're kind of doing this as we go, but do you have tips on shaping subtle, natural looking deciduous branches? He's used to shaping gnarly junipers. Gnarly juniper, subtle deciduous branches. So it depends. I freaking split that branch. I knew. Oh, no. I was talking as I was cutting. You got to really ease up on the saw, those last few cuts. Should be okay. I don't know. We'll see. If we're going to do that right now, and let me just show you this. Eve, can you see that split that's happening right there? Okay. Kind of split in half. Let's talk about how we patch that because when we're dealing with this kind of a scenario where we're trying to work this wound, it's very common for the saw to slip or for our razor blade to slip. How do we fix that? Let me go ahead and whittle this down real quick. Let me see if I can tie this branch back in there. You have that pretty clear, Eve? Yeah. Okay, let me go ahead and cut this, make sure I don't totally knock it off when I'm just dealing with this, and then I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that uh, question, Sam. Okay. Um... Hang on, hang on. Oh. I I'll come back come to back that. Yeah, let, let, me, let, me just <laughs> let me just focus so I don't totally dismantle this because I just cut this back to that branch for the exact reason of using that branch. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and heal that. I'll patch that real quick so that it's not covered by any tape. Okay, so I'll just, just nice clean cut, clean up the edges with my razor blade. Okay, this is where the saw seemed favorable. Lost a little focus there. Okay, watch how I patch this now. I've got a 50% split here. If we're going to have a split like this, it needs to happen at a time where we're heading into a major season of growth. Spring prior to bud push 
or fall prior to vascular growth. I'm gonna take some of my liquid cut paste. Okay, the putty is not gonna do us any good at this point in time. I'm gonna take some of my liquid cut paste and I'm just gonna really liberally apply it to that split. Okay, get it nice and gooed up. I'm gonna get both sides, both sides and make sure that any open tissue from that split has this liquid cut paste on it. Okay, let me go ahead and wipe my finger off. Of course, I left Sam, workshop Sam with, oh, I got it, I got some, okay? Now this is where parafilm tape is literally your best friend. When we have these small little breaks, cracks, and we need to go ahead and patch that. And parafilm degrades in the sun, so keep this stuff in your, in your tool case. And even in your tool case, where it gets older, and when you try to stretch it, it's extremely breakable, it doesn't stretch. Okay, now what we want out of the parafilm is we want a little bit of, even those are bad. Okay, let's see how long it takes us to get to. Getting long, getting, yep, stretching a little more, a little more. There it is, okay? We want that really nice elongation there. And we wanna use the compression of that parafilm. So I'm gonna take this and I'm really gonna stretch it out so that I don't have a big, thick, cumbersome. You'll notice the different colors here. You see the unstretched, thicker portion here and then you see how clear this gets when it's nice and stretched out. I want that nice, thin, soft, flexible, stretchy stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna apply this as tight as I possibly can. And notice how that cut paste just oozes out everywhere, okay? Now this first wrap has to be a little bit ginger so that we get that to stick to itself. Now after this point, you can see the cut paste oozing out. I'm gonna use this just as a way to prevent air from getting in and to prevent moisture from getting out, okay? Five or six wraps, that liquid cut paste is gonna seal both ends of that, the parafilm sticks to itself, and now I have a structure again by binding that tissue back together that I'm even gonna wire right now. And if it goes, it goes. If it lives, I'm gonna have the movement in it I want so I don't have to come back with a damaged branch later and try to get that movement. Okay, great, great lesson to learn how we heal or patch a mistake at this time of year. Best time of year to do it prior to vascular growth. Okay. What was the question that we were talking about? We were talking about shaping subtle, natural looking ah, deciduous branches. Yeah, perfect, okay. So it depends on how thick the branch is that we're shaping, what that subtle deciduous movement looks like. Cause you can see that, and Jesus, can you just focus right in here on this? Okay, there's, there's, there's sort of some undulating movement through these leaves that exist here. Right, so this, the, there's dimension to this. It moves to the back, it comes to the foreground. It's just not an S curve. It has a lot of different compound curves in there, okay? But that's relatively what we would quantify as severe movement or maybe not so subtle. However, we talked about the fact that this is very thin and as it thickens, that movement is gonna become quite subtle as that branch gets to a diameter of something like this structural piece here. It's gonna be very, very soft. So the key to putting good subtle movement into our deciduous trees is hitting them at a point where they're very thin and malleable, putting more dramatic movement in, knowing the thickening process is gonna soften it. If we're trying to bend bigger, thicker pieces, deciduous trees inherently are more brittle than a conifer. We're not gonna be able to add such severe movement as this to a thicker piece, and it's not gonna be able to dilute that severe movement by the thickening process if it's already close to a thickness that you're looking for. So in that case, you're limited by the material's ability and malleability. So you can only put soft, subtle movement into that piece. When they're thin, make it severe, knowing thickening is gonna soften it. When they're thick, you're limited already. Do the maximum that you can do, and it will be subtle at best. Um. Eric wants to know if you think that alder is a viable species for a deciduous bonsai. Yeah, that's a great question. Alder is something that um, people have asked me about before, and I would say I have never worked with alder, but here's the thing. Why wouldn't it be a viable solution? Alder does have a propensity to die back, much like a lot of our birch, some of our zelkova. We talked about these uh, tamarisk. We've talked about these easy dieback species. And the way that we sidestep that is not letting them grow uncontrolled, but letting them grow, cutting them back, letting them grow, cutting them back, and building up that compartmentalized tissue, interior buds, shorter inner nodes, and then letting them grow after you've built that. You have that adventitious bud set up, you have that compartmentalized feature set up, 
then you let them grow and you can always cut it back and the tree will have the buds to create new branches, but it will also have the tissue to compartmentalize that. This is the Dennis Voitia podcast. If you haven't listened to it, have a listen. He goes through this and he has created some of the best birch I've seen in the world as a result of this technique. Alder, very similar to birch, very similar strategy in my mind, mentality and thought process to the actual handling to, to overcome that easy dieback scenario. Um, but I don't see why alder couldn't be an absolutely stellar species for bonsai. Um, I think the reason people probably don't use it uh, to date is because alder is also associated with uh, the harboring of a lot of different pathogens as a part of the cyclical nature of those pathogens. Um, but other than that, as, as a model for deciduous, absolutely doable. Um, Douglas wants to know, when talking about further fertilization, are you adding organic solids such as biogold or a liquid fertilizer? Um, so we, we've, yeah, we've experimented a lot this year. If anybody's been following the, um, the podcast we've been doing with Ian on the soil food web and the theories of Dr. Ingham, we've played with a lot of different fertilizers this year and, and sources of nutrition. We're still trying to uh, figure out how we feel about the different opportunities that exist and their applicability to bonsai. And so I would say I don't have a firm um, diagnostic from that experiment quite yet, but we continue to work at it. Uh, here's what I do know though. Biogold got Mirai to where it has been over the past 10 years, and it's pretty freaking good. And from what I've seen of Biogold's behavior, the quality of growth it produces, et cetera, it's been extremely high quality, compact, mature, refinable growth. And that's really what we're looking for in a fertilizer source. You will never go wrong going with Biogold as your source of nutrition. When we get into the mid and late fall with deciduous, because Biogold has an even nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium, or a fairly well-balanced distribution of it, it can be too much nitrogen for a deciduous tree that is high water mobility and has the ability to pop as a result of nitrogen. Japanese maples and trident maples would be the most guilty of that. And that's where we need to find a substitution for a low nitrogen feed. But Biogold, a heavy feed in the early fall, totally legitimate, great way to go about the fertilization process, feed the microbial activity, and use that organic source. Uh -huh. Alex wants to know, would it be okay to heavily prune the roots and branches on a Chinese elm and transfer to a slab in late spring, or is that too much stress all at once? Depends on, depends He's on in how- in Southern California. Depends on how healthy the tree is. If it is a ragingly strong, healthy tree, and Chinese elm typically tends to be very strong and very tolerant to that kind of work, but you need to see the kind of buildup. So you saw with the pomegranate how big it was when we did that cutback. This Cydonia was this big when we did that cutback in the early spring and did the repot at the same time. If you don't have big, ragingly strong growth, you don't wanna push the envelope of that tree. So you decide if the tree's giving you and you've preemptively built up its strength to accept that big work, then absolutely go for it. But if it's not, if it's not abundantly strong or you haven't built it up, probably wise to do one operation, give it time to recover, and then come back into another. Okay, I've got one more piece here because we're kind of getting to the end of the structural. And I just want to kind of pull up the, the bigger leaves here and show you guys some of these structural decisions that I'm dealing with. Now, when we start to look at the undercarriage, you'll notice that we have branches opposing each other, and then we have a branch fork right here behind one of the big stump cuts that we made. I'm gonna clean up this cut with my knob cutters because I, I don't wanna try and dig my saw into that uh, area, right? And then I'll, I'll clean it up with my razor blade and paste it, and I can show you guys that process. But when we start to get these opposing pieces, knowing that we're really gonna facilitate thickening and growth this fall in vascular production, this is where I wanna be referencing the fact that I have this big, beautiful structural piece here that I see being a part of the design of the tree. I don't want to facilitate another branch growing into this that is opposing a branch moving into a space in the tree where I need something to exist over the long run. So when I talk about removal, structural corrections, at this point in time, we remove some sprouting pieces from the base. I've been very, very conservative, but I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take this off fully at the base so that I avoid that pull to the left and to the right of this and that expansion of that thickening in that area. This is gonna be one of those decisions that I make to reduce it as a conservative way to continue to perpetuate the health of the structure. 
Be aware, you have a limited number of branches we can remove without stimulating that flush, so absolutely structurally uh, detrimental pieces can come out, basal pieces can come out. Notice I haven't pruned any of these tips as a result of not wanting to incite that next flush based on the time of year. So we had a request for a detail cam when you're cleaning the cut that you okay. just did. Okay, yeah. so let's, Jesus, can you see this right here? Okay, so watch closely. Now we know that the shoulder is here and let's just be really concise about where the shoulder exists. Okay, my branch connects right here, but my actual shoulder is up a little bit higher right here where that flare, see that flare of that branch connects to that tissue. So I want the deepest part of my concave cut to be at that depth, which means when I come back in and I bite into this and I put my concave cutters here, I'm not removing nearly, nearly as much tissue as you guys think I am, okay? So when I cut that back, the depth, the depth right there at that base is at the shoulder of that branch and you see these raised edges. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now notice that I don't have any living tissue here. I'm gonna have to come back and fix that. But the cleaning of the cut Okay, I'm gonna put these branches in my mouth so that I can show this to you. And this is how dedicated I am to educating the Mirai community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna take out a little bit more of this dead wood I got down to living tissue. I'm just gonna kinda, of, just gonna do a little bit of, little bit of chewing here, okay? just to get down to live, okay? Now I'm gonna take the edge of this cut and really, really clean it up. And this is the problem with kind of making two cuts. Notice that I've got a shelf here. This is, this kind of sucks. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to clean that up. Maybe I go with a little bit smaller knob cutter. Let me try this now that we're this far. See if I can clean this up. Ideally one cut, the dead tissue really threw me off. Ideally one cut allows us to get there. There we go, that'll work. That'll work, okay? Now I've exposed living tissue. Now I'm gonna take this blade. I'm gonna have to hold the branches in my mouth because I, I, I'm not gonna be able to keep them out of the way so you can see. I'm gonna take this blade and I'm gonna take this outer sort of cup. I've got the rim of this cup here. I've got the depth of that knuckle cutter here. I'm gonna cut this clean so that it's all the same depth, right? So watch how I do this. Okay, Jesus, can you zoom in on that? Full zoom. Okay. So you can see that I've got basically a level cut perpendicular to the structural branch where I've now cleaned up all the edges. And you can just see there's just, just a little bit of a divot right there. I'm basically flat. And notice where my edge of my cut is. I had just enough space to adjust that. I'm right at the top of that shoulder where it connects right there, okay? That's where I wanna be. If I can get to that point, I know that this is gonna heal and transition into a piece of movement that works into these branches and that's what we're looking for. You ready branches for in the mouth, first time. That was, that was special. First time, that was first, very special. <laughs> first time on Mariah Live. I loved that. That we've uh, ingested levery <laughs> for, 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 for your nutrition gonna hold these branches in my mouth. I'm gonna hold them in my mouth. Um, are you ready for some more questions? I'm ready. All right, um, Graham wants to know if you could be specific with the angle you're creating between the primary and secondary lines. So does the secondary come out at 30 degrees? So uh, I don't have necessarily a specific angle because I think when we talk about, I'm gonna create a downward angle in a conifer. And I set that typically in my defining branch. The defining branch guides the rest of the style of the tree. Typically in that initial structure, I try to get as many branches to mimic that as possible. Now, we know in Yamadori, there's deadwood on half of it. We wouldn't 
disrupt that. A field grown tree, there's a big thick branch here that we can only lower a certain degree so we can't match that angle perfectly. But if we get most of them to match that, that's how we get that asymmetrical form. In a deciduous tree, we're looking more for this broader billowy form as the finalized product of our deciduous tree. So when I'm looking at that, I have a lot more randomness knowing that that's gonna thicken and hold that shape in a deciduous tree. So as opposed to saying, I'm coming up at 30 or 45 or uh, you know, 20 degrees, I don't have that kind of consistency. I actually want a lot of variety in that. So if one comes up steeper, one comes out and dives down a little bit more and offers some freedom, one moves to the back first and then comes up, I think that's where we get the organic nature of the structure in the deciduous tree. So a good example of that would be we have a very tight upward move on this base. Can you see that, Jesus? Yep. Okay, very tight upward movement here because if this is gonna engage with this tree's design being this low down, I'm not just gonna chop this off. This gives me the ability to have a nice, small little ramified branch and really show scale on this tree, okay? So this one comes sharply up for it to engage knowing that it has to get off the soil level to be a part of the tree's aesthetic. Whereas this branch, I chose to roll it to the back and then I actually dropped it down and it has a much more lateral feel, okay? So when we look at this in the wide view, you'll notice in order for this to play, it's gotta be up and out. We've got this big space here, so I've taken this more lateral and down to engage with this. My upper apical pieces come up at a far steeper angle to form this, whereas these pieces that are out of the side, a little bit more outward as opposed to upward to get out and create that width. Add that variety and don't try to lock in too much, right? The consistency and the style of the movement, right? Not creating the same S curve, not creating the same spiral, having that up and out, maybe one drops down, maybe one goes up and rolls to the back. That kind of organic differentiation is really what we're looking for and that style of that movement being consistent is really where we're headed in terms of creating a good structure that we know we can improve upon. Uh, Michael wants to know if you air layer in fall, would you consider cutting in fall or wait till spring? Um, so I think it's too early to hypothesize about air, air layering and its success because I've never, one, done it, have no idea how fast it's gonna produce roots, and my guess is they're not gonna produce roots. I don't think it will be as successful because we're not re, we're, we're reinventing the wheel a little bit. There's a reason that spring, late spring, or, um, or the very onset of summer has kind of become the defining moment for air layering to occur. Um, the Japanese have done it for you know hundreds of thousands of years. Well, maybe not that much, but they've done it for hundreds of years. Uh, the horticultural community in North America finds that to be the ideal time frame to air layer. They do it as a career, so they're maximizing their dollar and the time invested. I'm guessing it's gonna be m maybe a little fruitless and it's gonna require some winter protection, which is probably what you're gonna ask about. If you don't sever it in the fall, are you gonna have to protect it? Probably, you probably are, because you've now disturbed the system. Primarily what you've disturbed, if you air layer below the lowest branch, you've disturbed the system of the sugars getting to the roots to prevent the roots from having excessive damage from cold conditions. That's dangerous, and that's probably why people don't do it. Protecting it in a greenhouse would probably offset that, but I doubt we get to air layer in the fall and separate in the fall. Seems unlikely. Um, Eric says he feels like he's supposed to be building cloud-like shapes in his deciduous branches, soft curve, then sharp curve, smooth, sharp, smooth, sharp. Is that right? Um... I don't think that you have the ability to create smooth, sharp, smooth, sharp. Um, and I've never heard that before. That's never been an analysis of the deciduous form that I've ever, uh, that I've ever experienced or been asked about. So I, I, uh, it's catching me a little off guard because I'm trying to think, is that what we're trying to do? I, I've never quantified it as that. Um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of the movement that we put into a conifer or a deciduous leans on the nature of the material. Is the material sharp? bends and smooth sharp smooth sharp is it smooth smooth is it no movement at all and we're going to create this movement knowing it's going to grow out of it i think we think need to think on that line about how we create the movement stylistically nature of the species etc um yeah i don't know what to say about that i've never thought about it like that but let me 
let me give it some thought. I, I don't immediately connect to that as maybe a good backbone of decision making on movement you put in. So I'm, I'm putting in movement that uh, is every angle in space is different. Um, and I'm trying to occupy spaces where I know significant branches need to exist. And I'm maintaining that consistency with that first move up before I go anywhere else with it. And that for me is the primary component of deciduous movement. And again, bear in mind that I'm not speaking broadly about deciduous movement. I'm speaking about deciduous movement when we're styling a tree that we've stump cut and we've got this push out of young twigs and we're at a point where they've solidified, the tree is strong again and we can put this movement in while they're still flexible. This is the movement that I know is gonna soften as the tree grows out. Um, but I can't put a sharp piece of movement into it. It'll break. Deciduous trees have a threshold, um, although they are quite flexible in the fall uh, because there's a lot of resource movement that's taking place. Um, Eric says he guesses he could call it seagull or M-style curves like in old cherry blossom trees. I mean, so. it would be amazing if you could wire that in. I think a majority of those are probably pruned in. And that's really where when we think about this, Okay, even if you look at this and you say, man, all of those lines, that looks, that looks ridiculous. Okay, cool, that's fine. I mean, you guys do, you do your deciduous the way you want. You know, in three years, let's come back and take a look at this. Because bear in mind, again, I'm only going to be using the first 30% maximum of each of these. And again, I'm giving myself the chance in case something serendipitous happens to use more of that branch. But chances are I'm going to cut these back again, get a flush of secondaries, wire that out into the billowing pads, and by the time I get to tertiary, it's gonna be a clip and grow methodology to my deciduous building. Because this has no real interesting structural pieces, this big stump, this big stump, push some growth, and I'm easing that transition, I'm putting the movement into these at a relatively low place on those stubs and easing that transition, but I still have to build in from primary to secondary to tertiary. This is a very rough, raw styling. This is a, a deciduous styling that works for any deciduous species that you can go get at a garden center, a, a piece of nursery stock, and you can take that, cut it back, and now you know how to respond, the seasonality to respond, the, the mentality to respond to it. Let's see, next up, Kim wants to know if she should be wiring her pomegranates developing branches right now. Um, if, if the tree has been strong, responded strongly, grown strongly, and you want to be putting those branches into a position at a point where they're gonna be movable, and you don't want them to thicken anymore until you put that movement into them because they will thicken over the course of the fall and become quite rigid, then now would be the time, and that would be your motivation to do so. And again, bear in mind, I'm dealing with a tree that has very coarse leaves that's gonna thicken very, very rapidly. Pomegranate, too, will give you a little bit of thickening, smaller leaves, so not as severe, right? But definitely at this time of year, to maximize the capacity to alter the shape of a deciduous tree that you're putting structural movement into, most severe movement on the tree is going to be in the structure, not in the secondary, not in the tertiary. This is the time to do it because it's only going to get thicker, more brittle, and only accumulate more vascular tissue on the shape, which it, had we not manipulated it, was a very straight branch. Um, Rafi says, I understand to wire... I understand to wire to give a sustainable chance for all branches that have a possibility to be a part of the final design. How should I deal with branches that for sure will not or even prevent? How should I deal with branches that for sure will not be part of the design or even that prevent the wiring out of useful branches? Um, so I've chosen to remove those pieces that are either structurally detrimental or, um, or are definitively not going to be a part of the design. In, to, in tonight's piece of work. And I feel very comfortable knowing that those pieces were not gonna be a part of it. I can get away with the removal of those, have the structure be what I want it to be, but not prune the tips to really incite that second flush of growth. And the only reason that a, a deciduous tree would start to produce a second flush of growth is if you remove the hormone at the tip or if you reduce so much of the foliar mass that you decrease its production of sugars and starches over this important time of year, to a degree, it has to regenerate them. And generally, when we look at that, 50% removal will most of the time not incite another flush. We have to go below that, which is why in the quince, instead of going 50%, we went two-thirds reduction. 66% comes off, it has to push again. It has to replace that sugar starch production, okay? 
So you have a fairly significant threshold to be able to remove structural flaws or definitively not usable branches at this time of year without having that circumstance occur. But use that 50% mark as a general safe line that you can function within to do that reduction. Um, Adam would like you to talk about the placement of the tree in the, this tree in this pot. Was it offset to do due to a root? Would you ever consider hanging the root outside the pot on a deciduous tree? You know, it, it's it's tough to hang roots outside of pots unless they come back in and have the right structure to exist within. Would I ever think about doing that? Absolutely. The more innovative you can be with aesthetics, I think the more interesting a tree can become. I've never been posed with a deciduous tree that allows me to do that. We do have a hornbeam on a diagonal rock where there's a big root, prominent root. Actually, it was a part of the secondary branch building for the hornbeam uh, feature piece of content. And we also styled that on a stream last year. Um, and that was a root that maybe could have hung off the edge of the pot had we not put it on a stone. Um, but for this tree, it was offset because, and Jesus, can you just give him a close up of the root base right here? Okay, so this thick root right here, which is dark and wet, so it's tough to see. We've had uh, an unseasonable amount of rain uh, the past few days. This actually touches the edge of the pot, which is why it's pushed to the right side. But I did want to constrict the strength of a Cydonia because it is so coarsely leaved, so I put it in a smaller pot even though the structure wasn't created. If we had a much finer leaf tree, you would not want to put it in this small of a pot and then try to grow out the structure. So this is more a size, proportion, leaf, and behavior of the species that cause this. Typically, if we're growing structure, we want it in a box. We want it in a bigger pot, allow that sort of unchained strength. Very special scenario, but I put it in its offset because of that root system. Could you hang it off? Yes, you could. Right circumstances. I haven't seen that yet. Be innovative with your design. Absolutely. Uh, Paul said, since this tree still seems to be in development and will have a lot of branches to grow, a lot of healing of cuts to go, would it be better to pot this into a slightly larger pot to encourage more rapid and possibly coarse growth? Right, yeah, so it's, uh, you know that question comes after I just answered it. But right. again, just to drive the point home, the reason that I chose this for this tree is Cydonia has such a big leaf that no matter what I do, as long as the leaf is that big, it's gonna be growing faster and thickening faster through photosynthesis with that kind of a solar panel, then I can control. So in the developmental process, if I want branches that big, over the course of this fall with leaves this big in a bigger container, it might grow to a point beyond the thickness that I actually want for that transition. So this is a more of a, a control mechanism for a vigorous tree with this kind of leaf size where the tree is this small of material. But for a tree that you want that bigger growth and development, absolutely a box, a bigger pot, like we did with the Trident Maple Root Graft this past spring, and it had a ragingly strong year in that monstrous box that we planted it in. That is a theory for development that you definitely want to implement. And this is a little bit of a special scenario. Okay, um, Gary wants to know, how many years will it take for the transition of taper between the old thick branches and the new thin ones to become smooth? Yeah, great question. So when we think about how much time is it gonna take, we have to understand that a very small leafed variety of a tree, a very small solar panel tree, like a Chinese elm, is gonna take longer for that elm to thicken to a degree where it bridges that transition of taper and really heals all of those wounds. It's gonna take it a little bit longer. When we deal with a very large leaf variety, like a quince, a Chinese quince, Cydonia, et cetera, and there's a lot of large leaf varieties that we use. A uh, well, that's not a good one because they don't heal very well. I was gonna say camellia, but that's, let's scratch that. They don't heal well at all. What's another, a, a beech. A, a, a beech in a young, vigorous state has a very large leaf they are able to thicken and heal very, very quickly and very, very easily as a result of that large photosynthetic surface area if we handle the shoulder correctly and we handle the way that we cut those branches to, to create that transition, okay? So that solar panel answers the question more than any sort of arbitrary time that I throw out and say, this is how long it should take, right? 
The more sugars and starches that the solar panels accumulate, the faster it's gonna thicken over the fall season. The more we apply supplemental nutrition in addition to those solar panels, the more we're gonna aid in all everything being possible for that vascular tissue to be produced and it's gonna thicken faster. So it hinges on how you're applying supplemental nutrition, the characteristics of the tree, and how you've handled it in terms of the balance of water and oxygen, space to grow the root system, et cetera, to answer that question, right? And that, that becomes the complexities of bone side that we're all trying to function within. Cool. So just two, two left here. Graham wants to know, does it matter if some leaves are upside down after new movement is put yes. in place? Yes, it does. It matters greatly if leaves are upside down. And one thing that you'll notice, I've got one branch back here that I'm actually glad that you asked that about because I'm going to go ahead and rotate that. And notice how I can rotate and still add movement so that I actually treat the rotation as, as sort of a, a, a supplemental addition to the movement. Um, but we want the leaves to be facing upwards when we end in the styling process. And, and here is why. When we roll that upside down, the underside of the leaf is not photosynthesizing. This is where gaseous exchange is occurring. And it actually has an accumulation of hormones on the underside of the leaf that are very allergic to sunlight or not capable of tolerating that sunlight. Very easy to damage. So if we roll them upside down and then we're like, cool, we're going to get all this vascular production in the fall, what's actually going to happen is that's going to burn. We're going to lose all of those upside down leaves and we actually detriment the tree from having wired it at this time of year. So you'll notice, again, when I uh, face this forward, almost every leaf, and there are going to be exceptions where you rolled here and then, you know, got the orientation back and this one's slightly a hinge, but we don't want to flip things upside down. That's not going to be favorable for the tree's fall vascular growth. Okay, so let's walk through the end of this. I'm going to come and join you guys. Okay, so you can kind of see how we've created this up and out vibe. You can see where the, the pieces that can contribute to an apical formation exist. You can see where we've occupied space on the right side where we had nothing. You can see how we took the lower left piece and put it into play. We have no idea if we're going to use that. Maybe, maybe in, in another you know, year we're like, this is a ridiculous idea, but at least we tried it. It's there. It's going to help with the uh, continued acceleration of growth and photosynthetic resources. No problem leaving it. It's not causing any structural issues. No harm, no foul. What if it turns into something really character filled and great? Cool. Let's give it that opportunity. We've pasted everything. We've made those transitions. The space in the canopy does, does exist for this to be a great tree. Movement is, is different and differentiated between those pieces. And we know doing it now at this time, maintaining that leaf mass, the thickening is going to soften that movement and give us something very similar to some of these pieces that have a relatively dramatic directional shift in the tree. We have done our job. We've taken advantage of a tree that was ready for this work at the time, the very first time we could approach it while those branches were most malleable. The product of doing this at this time of year is that we're gonna have a higher quality structure on this tree as it evolves over the course of time, maximizing our ability to put that movement in right now and leaving the leaf mass on to pay us back for our efforts. I hope this was educational for you guys. I love coming back to fundamental trees and just the process of making trees is so freaking awesome because it's this is a, this is a stump and we've just done a major operation that makes a stump something more significant than that harnessing the tree's ability at the right time of the year with the right strategy and expressing your aesthetics this is bonsai this is why we all do it so take advantage of this time of year take advantage of the knowledge you've gained tonight put it to work in your deciduous trees and let us see the results i'd be super stoked to see some awesome deciduous trees styled on the uh the forum q a send us pictures so we can see them anyways evolving our deciduous knowledge this is a big one come back and check out that calendar at the beginning of the stream when it goes into the library again that will serve you well just to have that baseline knowledge and we will see you guys next week Lebanese cedar, get ready. It's a big one. All right, have a great night. Thank you guys. Mwah.